A 2-0 win then doesn't quite tell the whole story of La Liga champions, but of course we know Real Madrid have won 15 Champions League and European Cups, eclipsing AC Milan by eight now it is, of course, a trophy that very much belongs uh, to Real Madrid. Uh, for more on this, outside Wembley, uh, Gav is with us, as is Jules. Frank LeBeouf uh, joins us as well. But overall, Stevie, you just felt after what happened in the first half, where Borussia mm. Dortmund had those chances, you just knew that Real Madrid weren't going to be the same team as they were in the opening 45 minutes. Yeah, it would have been a shock had they come out and, and delivered the, the rubbish that they gave us in the first half. Mm. And you had, to, you had to think, the longer this game went on, we all sat there and thought, oh, this has got, this has got a 1-0 written over it, never mind 2-0. And pretty much that's the way it worked out. Not a good performance from Real Madrid whatsoever. Uh, it couldn't, other than the finishing, it couldn't have gone any better for, what, 75 minutes for yeah. Borussia Dortmund? But you know what? Cup finals are not about playing well. Playing lovely passes, silky soccer, it's about winning. That's the only thing that matters. And unfortunately for Dortmund, Real Madrid know how to win. And they did that today. It was a similar pattern to what we saw in the FA Cup final mm. last week. But of course, Manchester United took those chances. Mm. If Dortmund had, I think we'd be having a different conversation. They didn't. The rest is history. Uh, Borussia Dortmund joins an ever-growing list of teams that go back into the locker room after having played Real Madrid. And they ask themselves the question, how did we lose that match. How did we let this get away? And so some people may frame this as a moral victory for Borussia Dortmund that they should be proud of themselves. No, that's not how it works. As a professional player in this sort of moment, in this sort of opportunity, knowing that Real Madrid were vulnerable, knowing that you had the opportunities, this is indeed a wasted, glorious chance for Borussia Dortmund to win this title. It was there. Real Madrid were hanging on. They were wobbly. They didn't quite know how to address some of the tactical decisions by Aiden Terzic. And physically, Real Madrid seemed second best to every challenge in the first half. They didn't quite know how to address the, the movement from Adeyemi. They didn't quite know how to figure out Jadon Sancho. They didn't quite know how to address Marcel Savitzer. You're going to have time. Carlo Ancelotti makes some adjustment, forces Vinicius Jr. to get a little deeper, and then that made it more difficult, more complicated for Borussia Dortmund to create opportunities of their own. And eventually, Real Madrid, in a final of Champions League, they're just automatic. They're automatic. They're invincible. They know that. You know who else knows that? Borussia Dortmund. And they would have known, we've given up too many opportunities here, too many chances. We didn't take advantage of that. Now, at some point, we're going to get punished. And they did. Frank, what is it that you always say about finals? <laughs> That's what it is. Uh, as TV said, you know, you don't have to play well, don't have to create chances, you just have to win it. And Borussia Dortmund, oh my God, I don't want to be in their dressing room right now. Um, th that's the worst of the worst, you know. As, as Ali said, you know, if you lose 4-0, nothing to say, Real Madrid is better. Yeah, you, you can be angry and sad, but you don't have regrets. They are full of regrets. And... Uh, I hope the young Madsen won't be uh, um, hammered by the fans because of the, the, the pass that he made as a second goal. But come on, Adeyemi, he has to do better. He's a, mm. he's a fantastic player. He has to finish the action, especially the first one on this Hummel's pass. I mean, that was a golden pass. You have to finish. That's the difference. You give the ball one time to uh, Vinicius Jr., even with a, the worst of the worst shot because there is a bun before. I mean, he scores. Adeyemi has two chances, and he didn't. And as we all agree, it was over. We, we felt it. Half time, you know, I bet with my wife a bottle of champagne that uh, Real Madrid will win because Dortmund wasted their chances. It's what happened. It's history after. They know exactly Real Madrid. They know exactly what they have to do. They have the history of the club on their shoulder. It's heavy, but it, it, it helps them to fly. And it's what happened. And they won it, and it's the luck of the champion, so well done to them. Uh, we could sense it, obviously, watching on TV. Gavin Jules, when Carvajal scored, you just felt the whole tone of the game change. Yeah, no question about it. There was a momentum shift. I think, actually, for me, it was before that, just a few minutes before that. Uh, if you remember, that there was this run by Vinicius where he takes on Hummels, sends the ball one way, he goes around him the other way. Then he kind of does this uh, sort of backheel nutmeg on, on Rearson. And, and I kind of felt at that point, and maybe even before that, even with the, the Miss Bellingham chance where 
you know, he kind of runs back with a wry smile. I, I, I sort of felt the momentum kind of shift there. And uh, look, this first half, Jules, I, this reminded me, I, I'm going to date myself here. If you remember Pulp Fiction, the Samuel Jackson character, he stumbles into kind of the, the drug den and the guy unloads the, the entire gun at him and somehow he doesn't hit him and he's unscathed. And so from that moment on, he's like, look, I have a chance to live again. I have a chance to make things right. And I kind of felt that's what it was for, for Real Madrid after that, 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 that first half. And, you know, I thought Ancelotti moved Bellingham inside. I think that certainly helped from sort of that, that, that weird outside position. He was playing certainly out of possession in the first half. And, and, and I think they had that confidence and it felt like they got this. Yeah, it certainly looked that way, Jules. And obviously, Dortmund with those chances early on in that first half. The fans were fantastic throughout the Dortmund supporters. But as Ali said, as much as you want to like label it pride or brave, in the end, it was a real missed opportunity from the German side. Ah, incredible. And at halftime, I think we were all in agreement, everybody, wherever you were sat in the stadium. Even the Dortmund fan, you could feel... They had that great choreography with the flares straight at the start of the second half, but they knew that their chance had passed, really. And this is it. If you don't punish this Real Madrid team, they will come back and punish you. And it's inevitable. And we knew as soon as that Carvajal goal went in, especially. But even before that, I agree with Gab, you could feel in the stadium that there's a full quick header at nil nil as well that yeah. Courtois makes a save. It's not a difficult save, but that's another shot, another shot on target. And by then, Real Madrid had nothing. They didn't create anything. The lack of creativity for a team like that, with Cruz, with Vinicius, with Rodrigo, mm. with Bellingham, there was no creativity at all for an hour, easily. And then after that, once that first goal went in, it was over. But it felt just inevitable that at some point, Borussia Dortmund would be punished for the, for the chances that they missed. And that Real Madrid, inevitably, at some point, would score, would get half a chance and would get a goal. And if you look at that first goal, Madsen considered the corner. He should have never considered the corner. That shot goes wide. He should know that the, goal, the ball goes wide instead of that bad reflex. It's another corner. He's the one marking Carval initially. And then it's, it's just those little mistakes that you make against Real Madrid, against this team, you end, up, you end up really being punished for them. Take me into the players' heads from a Dortmund perspective, Stevie. Do we make too much of the fact that this is Real Madrid? No, not at all. No. And the reason I say not at all is because they've done it so many times. But from a Dortmund perspective, they will not be thinking about the stuff that we're talking about, how Real Madrid always come back, this, right. this, this, this way they have of winning games. Because when you're, when, when you're playing the game and things are going for you the way they were going for Dortmund, all they're thinking about is... Can we do this again? Can we get Adeyemi through again? Can we get Sancho through? You know, can we get the ball to Fulcrig? So they're not running around thinking, well, oh, we're going to have to score here because Real Madrid always come back. That's not what they're thinking. Real Madrid just took, took one chance that they made. Mm. And it's not even a chance. Let's, let's be honest. It's not even a chance. It's, it's, a, it's a, a corner kick that's thrown in the box to the near post. And then it's hope. Let's hope one of us gets on the end of it. That's all this is. And Carvajal does that, and that completely changes the game. But up until then, Dortmund are thinking about how do we create another chance? How do we get up the other end and get another opportunity? They're not thinking about Real Madrid being Real Madrid. That, that's not what they're thinking. Why were they so poor? I really think that structurally, uh, Real Madrid did not address some of the things that we thought Borussia Dortmund were going to do in this game. I think our anticipation was that perhaps Borussia Dortmund were going to have a difficulty getting Adeyemi out in the attack and Jadon Sancho out in the attack because they were going to be so busy defending Rodrigo and Vini Jr. And the truth of the matter is that it was actually Rierson getting forward, Adeyemi getting forward, Jadon Sancho getting forward, Madsen getting forward, and it's actually Real Madrid having to address Dortmund being aggressive on the attack, being on the front foot instead of being conservative. And I think Real Madrid were surprised by that. That only happened because the quality of the possession by Real Madrid was not good enough in the first half. Too many turnovers. And in fact, uh, Carlo Ancelotti in a post-game interviews refer to the performance in the first half 
too many losses of the ball, too many, too many turnovers, but also describe his team as vagos. Vagos means lazy. Mm. Lazy in the first half. Lazy in their possession. Lazy in their defending. No recovery runs happening from, from the white guys. Vinicio wasn't recovering. That's why you saw him at the beginning of the second half actually in a deeper defensive position. Rodrigo wasn't recovering. Jude Bellingham out of position as well. He was sort of drifting into open areas but not really helping out defensively. You saw from Carlo Ancelotti adjustment. And he sensed it. He, he knew they were in trouble. He knew that their possession wasn't good, that structurally they weren't good, that discipline wasn't quite there. And because you're allowing all these things to happen for Borussia Dortmund, now they felt confident like they could play against Real Madrid. But I, I, I do think, while, while I agree with you, Stevie, that, that, yeah, Borussia Dortmund players are not thinking, oh, my goodness, this is Real Madrid. I do think that there is something to be said about if you keep missing opportunities, something builds within you that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a seed of doubt. It's, I, don't, I don't think it's so much confidence as it is, man, we're letting these opportunities go, we're letting these opportunities go, and eventually this is going to hurt us. We've been in enough games to know that you miss a lot of chances against a, against a team of the quality of Real Madrid, eventually they're going to hurt you, and they did, and there was no response from Borussia Dortmund. I think one of the problems, or certainly one of the big problems Madrid had for the majority of the game was Tony Cruz was way too deep. Mm -hmm. Tony Cruz, yes, played some, some balls from one half to the other, way out to the right-hand side to Carvajal getting forward. But when he wasn't doing that, he was, getting, he was picking balls up from the centre-backs and just rolling three- and four-yard balls. And so why don't you let the centre-backs do that? Tony Cruz should and could have been 10 yards further forward. And because he's not, when they cough the ball up, they're a man down in the middle of the park. And so that means that Dortmund can get after them. And Tony Crows is not catching anybody in a race. So I think a huge part of the problem was Tony Crows was far too deep. Uh, Real Madrid won the game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, they did. Yeah. It's, it's and of course, they won it, Frank, because that goal from Carvajal just changed things. Defensively, how frustrating is it? Because as we showed in the highlight, there was a warning shot before. They tried it before with Carvajal at the near post, yet no one was picking up for the goal. Yeah, and you don't expect Carvajal to do a header like that. I think uh, in, I don't know how much Champions League games he played. I think he scored only twice in out of 80-something games. And uh, he's not a, known as a big-time header kind of guy. <laughs> and uh, and it's why they put maybe Madsen, who is not uh, that tall, because Cavaral is not tall. And you, you, you have other targets, Bellingham, uh, Rüdiger, and some others. And um, the, the, the corner kick is perfect. Uh, Cruz, we know, is, a, is, a, is an expert in on that matter. And, uh, and uh, the run from uh, Cavaral is good. It's the right spot at the right time. And uh, I don't know who said that, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just a free kick. It's just a corner kick. I think it's Gabby. So we say that it's just a corner kick and you don't expect uh, something good out of it. And uh, we know that Borussia Dortmund they're quite good defensively because of uh, the, the, the height of the, the, most, uh, the most players. But it wasn't enough. And the header is perfect after all. And mm. even uh, Hummers tried to save it with his hand. But it wasn't, it wasn't enough. Can I just come back on the penalty? I know Halley said it's oh, not a penalty. No, don't start. It's not a I, penalty, I Frank. Don't start. We haven't got that. We've got time oh, to make I a can, penalty. I, excuse me. I know, I know it's, a light, it's a light push. It's not shorter against shorter. It's a light push. But it would have been in the middle of the park. The referee would have given a free kick. So let, explain to me why you give a free kick in the middle of the park. For example, on Billingham, when Sabitzer barely touch him and why you don't give a penalty because it's a, a foul is on a 16-yard box from a deliberate deliberate push from Mendy uh, uh, on the back of, uh, of uh, Adeyemi. Well, if you think it's not a penalty, if it's not a push, if it's a push, there is a foul. If there is a foul, there is a penalty. Light or not light? No, no, that's my, my I just opinion. thought, I thought, nice, we've had a big game, we don't have to work VAR or referees or officials, and then you throw that in, Frank. Is there penalties are enough there for you, Stevie? <laughs> no, I think, I think the best way to put it, Frank, is there are anomalies in football where we all know some fouls are given in the, in the middle of the field right. that are not given in the penalty box. They, it's just one of those little anomalies... But I'm happy enough that it wasn't a penalty. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, let's, let's go back to Wembley. Guys, how surprised were you with that first half performance that we saw from Madrid? I, 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 I genuinely was surprised. I was surprised that 
I was surprised that, that you know, Jules and I often talk about um, substitutions to change games to turn things around. It really felt to me here, like Ancelotti said, look, I'm just going to challenge my guys. You guys can't be this bad. You guys got yourself into this. You guys get yourself out of it. That surprised me that, that he waited so long. Mm. Uh, he was obviously vindicated uh, in that. Uh, but, uh, but, yeah, I go back to my point about Bellingham. You know, out of possession, moving him into a wide area, especially on, on the Rearson side, to me, uh, it didn't make sense. I left that channel for, 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 for Sabitzer. And, and I think there's also a, a stat about how in, in the first half, I'm not big on those running stats, but um, the fact that uh, Borussia Dortmund, I think they ran something like four and a half kilometers more than uh, Real Madrid in the, in the first half. That makes a big difference. That tells you that, you know, they were breaking in numbers, they were outworking them, and, and it showed. And Gelotti's right when he says his team was a little lazy in the first half. It was a bit too predictable from a Real Madrid point of view. Emre Chan was on Bellingham. It was pretty easy. Then Rodrigo and Vinicius were picked by the, the four defenders that Dortmund had. And then Brandt and, and Sabitzer, to be fair, did a really good job on Valverde and Cruz. And then Fulkrug was in between the two centre-backs and Kamavinga. And, and this, this Dortmund team, we said it all along, they, they are in the final. They were in the final because they were very, very good in the Champions League, not so much in the league, but, very, but also the, the most physical team. They, they win the most jewels in the, in the Champions League this season. They've had the most tackles, they recover the most balls. This is what they do. And like Gabby just said, they outrun everybody. PSG, Atletico Madrid, PSV Eindhoven, Newcastle, anybody, everybody, they work just harder than everybody else. And I think in the first half, especially with the lack of creativity that Real Madrid had, because there was just not enough from all those big names that we've just mentioned already, Plus the fact that you don't win the, the duels, you don't win the second balls, you're, you're just not there. It's a bit too much. And that's why Dortmund was so superior, which was, again, we said in the second half, it was never going to be the same. Real Madrid were going to come back much better, much stronger. They went more to, to a 4-3-3 with Bellingham as a force nine and, and Rodrigo on the right and Vinny on the left. And that worked better. The balance of the team was much better. But also, they were stronger in all those duels, in all the, the balls that they didn't win in the first half that they won in the second half. Hey, you, can, you can talk about Angelotti maybe making a mistake with Bellingham. I'll tell you what he got completely 100% correct. The goalkeeper. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, everybody questioning how he's only had four games. He's been out all season. Is he going to be sharp enough? Is he going to be ready? But Lunin well, was sick, wasn't what? it? That kind of forced his hand. <laughs> it would, he was playing him regardless, Dan. OK. Absolutely, 100%. That just happened to fall into his lap and it made, it, it made everybody do exactly what he just did there. Uh, one more thing on Ancelotti. Gab brought it up. He didn't make his first substitution to the 85th minute. Yeah. As a manager, how easy is it to sit on your hands or not get desperate, not make changes? Well, it's, it depends where your mindset is. If you're a manager who wants to go and win the game, then you start figuring out how do I make changes to win the game. Angelotti's going, well, you know what? Right now, they don't look as though they're going to score on us, and I'm not going to go and make changes to try and win the game that might end up making us lose the game. So you know what? We're not at our best, but we're actually sort of comfortable. So I'll just let it play out right now, and I won't make any changes until maybe I have to. That's exactly how, that's called experience. That's, that's why Angelotti in particular is different to other managers, because he just knows when to make the right decision at the right time. And the right decision was do nothing, Absolutely. let it play out. So less is more. Correct. And, and it, it's one thing for us to say it from afar, but him being there and his son every five, ten minutes <laughs> getting in his face and he's here yeah. and telling him, hey, man, hey, we're struggling. <laughs> hey, I think, I think there's something. we got to make a change. How about this? How about that? And the calmness in Ancelotti and just, just go sit down over there, okay? I'll make the decisions. I know what we're doing. This team is trending. It seems like they're getting better. It seems like we're getting stronger and they're getting weaker. Let's see how it plays out. And he played out in favor of, of Real Madrid. But I think w we take it for granted how difficult it is to not make a decision when everybody thinks that you should make a decision and you're the only one saying, eh, calm down, everybody. Relax. It's only Champions League final. Uh, Frank, who was man of the match? Don't say the referee. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm, I think I would say Courtois. 
because, because what he did in the first half um, saved Real Madrid. And after, and after Kob Kobel could have been there as well, you know, but uh, he made one mistake on Bellingham and Courtois didn't make any mistake. I don't see anybody on the field, uh, I'm talking about the players, uh, putting outside the goalkeepers, uh, being better than anybody else. Uh, yeah, you can put one of the scorers and maybe Vinny tried hard. It was hard for him because it was like Mbappe against Paris Saint-Germain. Um, uh, let's say uh, marked by three guys almost and uh, Rierson had a very, very good uh, game as well. Um, but I don't see anybody doing something very special. So it's why I go for Courtois and for me the man of the match is Ancelotti. Uh, Courtois, boys, do you agree at Wembley? I, yeah, but look, I mean, if, if you want to go back and you look at it that way, without Courtois, um, then they're 2 0 down and they don't come back into this game because, you know, then you just, Adeyemi balls over the top, defended numbers. We've seen, uh, we've seen Turcic do that before to, to go and defend a lead. So, in that sense, you can certainly go and, and, and make that case. Um, I thought Valverde did a lot of running, um, and, and in the first half, uh, I, I, I thought that was that was a bit of a difference. I thought he linked up very well with with Dani Carvajal. Um, I think those two maybe stood out, but in the end, if you're going to pick a if you're going to pick a Madrid player, I think you've got to go with Courtois. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, that first half is the same that we saw in Paris against Liverpool. It's the similar. Like Courtois had the same first half against Liverpool two years ago that he had here tonight against Dortmund, and. Just on Real Madrid, imagine that you win the Champions League tonight. It's your sixth, it's the sixth Champions League in the last 10 years, right? And in two days' time, you will announce the signing of the best player in the world in Kylian Mbappe. <laughs> in this team already, it's just, and if you, you won La Liga, by the way, before, it's just, it's just man, and that's Real Madrid for you. But just, uh, just realize that you won yeah. the Champions League tonight, and in two days' time, you'll have a new player. You know, Manchester City won the Champions League last season. They, Mateo Kovacic was the next <laughs> signing that they had. Real Madrid but, win the Champions League again, like I said, six in ten years, and then Kylian Mbappe arrives in two days. And and you know just just to add to that, Jules, let's not let's never forget, let's never forget that this was a season that was supposed to be a transition season for Real Madrid because this was a season in which Benzema left, in which Mbappe was a no-show, the season in which Courtois gets injured, misses most of the year, David Alaba misses most of the year, Eder Militao misses most of the year, uh, Tony Kroos and Luka Modric were going to do their last dance thing. Tony Kroos is obviously, this was his last game. Modric, maybe his last game. We don't know yet. Um, so this was not supposed to be the season. You know, that's going to be next year when the Cavalry shows up. So I, I, to me, this makes it all the more remarkable. And if I can just say, Carlo Ancelotti has seven of these trophies uh, at home, uh, three with Real Madrid, two with Milan as a coach, two with Milan as a player. Yeah, some of his celebrations were absolutely brilliant. And it, it, no one's got a resume like this. No, and, and I don't think a manager of this stature is as beloved and respected by his players as Carlo Ancelotti is. Certainly, you, you think of the way that the players react to Ancelotti when he shows up for the celebration. There is, there is care. There is love, there is appreciation, there is respect, but it's also reverence to Carlo Ancelotti. He's one of the guys, but not really. He's in a, in a, in a different level entirely. And I, I just think that these players, they, uh, they're now at the point to where they blindly trust Carlo Ancelotti, whatever he says. And it's difficult when we're talking about players of the caliber and, and the talent of Real Madrid and the sort of money and attention that these players command, that they don't just go, I'll do what I'm going to do because I am who I am. Carlo Ancelotti, I think, somehow is able to connect with everybody on a personal level. And, and players are different. Players, some will listen, some won't. But they all seem to listen mm. to Carlo Ancelotti. They all seem to buy in. And so it's not a coincidence. It's not, this doesn't happen by accident. It's that experience that Stevie was talking about, but it's also the personal touch that Carlo Ancelotti has with his players. If, if you pull players that have played for Carlo Ancelotti over the years, the common thread would be how much appreciation and respect they have for him as a manager and as a person. And the thing that's always striking is that there's nothing disingenuous about it. It all no. seems organic from Ancelotti. I mean... Is there anybody that's close to him as far as being the GOAT? 
I don't think there is. Really? I don't think so. I've been sitting here trying to think who, who would be above them. So obviously at this generation, people would throw Pep at you. Well, Champions League, league right. titles. I mean, Champions League, straight off the bat. Sorry, Pep, straight back. I mean, I, again, I can't think of anybody. And I'm, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking about Fergie. I'm thinking further back. I, 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 as far back as I can go, I don't see anybody that beats this guy for being the GOAT. Absolutely not. And doing it in the manner in which he's doing it. Not a look at me sort of thing. Yeah. Not I'm going to be in front of the ca camera sort of guy. No, th the players are doing this. Focus on them. If somebody said to you, what kind of coach do you want to be? And you would come up with, well, I want to be great tactically. I want to be able to connect with the players. I want to, I want to, be, I want to be strong when it matters. I want to make good decisions when it matters most. I want to win. I mean, he ticks every single box. He, he, he's at the top of the tree in every single category. It is weird when you say the goat. It doesn't quite sound yeah. it's right coming well, out of your mouth. You're, you're, you're it's in. Funny, so <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, no. it's a bit like the gram. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, youth sorry. is on your side, sorry. Stevie. <laughs> sorry, let me do it differently. The greatest of all time. There we go. Uh, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's, that yeah. feels nicer. Uh, uh, Frank, where do you stand on Ancelotti? Uh, for me, he's the best of the best. You know, of course, you, know, you can say that Pep is, uh, is the best uh, manager of the world, but there is a real duel and... Uh, and uh, and today, Ancelotti proved that he really knows how to deal with a, <clears throat> with a, a bad season in terms of injury that he had and, uh, and uh, people leaving just before the season. And do you know what? I want to add also the, the, the staff that he has. Uh, I know Antonio Pintus, uh, a worker under him uh, when he was at Chelsea, and he said during an interview this week that... Uh, um, I think it was, I don't know where, they had a Super Cup final against Barcelona this season, and they had to... Re prepare, re uh, redo uh, a pre-season training, some pre-season training session to rebuild uh, the physical aspect of the of the squad, and you you only have one coach who are able to do that to say to the players, you know what, we have to rebuild our uh, our physique because we are not strong enough, and uh, it's only Ancelotti, and um, and the players don't complain about that. That's that's ab absolutely crazy how. He can handle, you know, the pressure, how he can love the, the, the player the way he loved them, how he can be a father and at the same time um, a professor. Uh, he's, a, he's a mister. He's a real mister, they say it in, uh, in Italy. Uh, it's a Real Madrid side, as Gav mentioned, that was supposed to be in transition. It's, only, it's a Real Madrid side that's only lost twice in the whole season in all competitions. Both of them were against their city rivals, Atletico Madrid. On paper, Gavin Jules, when you take a look at this, you think, wow, this has got to be in the conversation of being one of the best teams ever. But you don't feel it quite is because their style of play maybe isn't eye-catching as some of the other teams that we've seen over the years. Is that fair? Well, I, I, I would agree it's not as eye-catching, but also I think a lot of it is this is a team where you've got some great players who are a little bit older, maybe a little bit past their best, and Kroos and Modric. But then you look at some other guys who the best is yet to come. Mm. Schwameni wasn't even there. We haven't even mentioned, right, the, the hub of the midfield. Um, Kamavinga, 20 years old, playing in this game. Uh, Rodrigo, still very young. Vinicius is going to get better. Jude freaking Bellingham's going to be a lot better than he is now. So I, I think, you know, you balance those guys with the Nachos, the Carvajals, the Modric. It's, it's a team that's really caught between two generations. So uh, I, I think the reason we wouldn't say this is one of the greatest teams ever for me is, is that we expect these players to become even better as individuals. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this is, this is maybe not the greatest, but in terms of winning mentality, and how these team wins, even when they're not the best, like tonight. But like, even if you look, even against Leipzig in the last 16, they struggle at times in those two games. And they, they needed a, mm. a Brahim Jazz, won the goal in the first leg, for example. But in terms of winning mentality and having that DNA within them, this is the greatest team that we've ever seen. Who, who wins six in ten? <laughs> who wins six Champions League in ten years? Carvajal tonight is his sixth Champions League in the last 10 years, six times he's starter. And, and every time he brings something to that team, it's just an incredible winning team. And, and you can look at 
dynasties and legacies and the Boston Celtics or the Yankees in different sports, all of that, of course, and they're right up there. And yes, it might not be the most sexy football and at times it might not have been the most co convincing wins. Of course, we mentioned the Liverpool game two weeks ago, two years ago, sorry, the final tonight again. But it's all about winning, right? This is, this is what the game is about. And there's, not, there's never been a greatest winning team than this one. Because of the individual talent that you have at Real Madrid, sometimes I think we make the mistake of thinking that this is a, a team just in name and that really what makes them outstanding is that individual talent. A Vinicius, moment of brilliance. A Bellingham, moment of brilliance. Rodrigo, moment of brilliance. And I have to tell you, this team has been successful this season because they've actually been a team. A team that has relied on players that weren't supposed to be first-choice starters because of the injuries that Gab just, had, just alluded to uh, not too long ago. We're talking about Rudiger becoming a dominant center back, was always a good center back, but became a dominant center back this season because of the need of Real Madrid. He wasn't supposed to be starting. He was supposed to be Militao and Alaba. You have a guy in Andre Luning who wasn't second choice, he was third choice goalkeeper and ended up making big saves for this team in this running Champions League. Jose Lu, who knows where Jose Lu came from, and yet he scores the big goals that puts this team through to the final. And so, you can talk about Brahim Diaz. Jules just mentioned there the game against Leipzig. It took an individual effort from Brahim Diaz to win that game away from home and how good he was to close out the season. He didn't even play today. So while, while there is individual talent, this team has been successful because many different parts have actually played a role that I don't think they thought they would play and yet it has been critical to their success. They're the best team in the world, Stevie. Real Madrid? No. You'd I still think Man City is a better side. What if I was to get some sort of French international, say, who used to play for PSG over and chuck him in the team? Well, it's interesting that you say that because as soon as Ali said this was a team, the first thing that came into my head was, does Mbappé help or hinder the fact that this is a team? That's you the first thing that came into my head. So the fact that you're talking about that, I think... It's huge. And I don't think there's one of us can, can honestly, hand on heart, say, no question, there'll still be a team, mm. even with Mbappe in it. Because if you've got one, and one as big as him, and one as, as influential as him, both off the field and on it, not carrying his weight, that can cause some dissension in the dressing room. And so, who knows the answer to that? Well, let's ask our French contingent. Start with Frank. Will he help or hinder, Frank? <laughs> I think he's a, he's, a, he's a smart guy. He knows that he will have to, uh, to, um, to go into it and to accept uh, the way it works. And you have, for the first time, and maybe for a long time, we will have a coach who, who leads the dressing room, who decides for everything. And he will tell him, you know what? You do what I want, otherwise you're going to be on the bench because we don't need you. We won the Champions League in La Liga last year. We won it six times in ten years, so we don't need Mbappe. It's, uh, it's more Mbappe who needs Real Madrid to win the Champions League. So it's more Mbappe to work and to change the way he thinks football is. To uh, run after the ball when he loses it. That would be compulsory for him in order to be accepted by the other. And uh, no doubt, no doubt that he will follow the path. Vinicius Jr. was a little bit, uh, um, I would say, um, wasn't really keen to, to do that as well. But he worked on that. I'm not sure Bellingham was ready to, to do the work that he does. He was uh, at some point, you know, uh, working differently when he was working for, uh, playing for Dortmund. But they cope with the situation because they want, there is one guy and is a masterpiece, is Mr. Ancelotti, and he says it is what it is. And you do that, otherwise you don't play. Jules? Yeah, I think I, he's too smart. He's too excited. He watched the game tonight at Clafontaine with some of the players, and he was just watching. He just, he's just so excited to be there with them next season. And I think he's too intelligent to play the big star, here I am, look at me, I'm the highest earner in this dressing room, because he will be the highest earner that Real Madrid have ever had. He will earn more money than anybody in the history of that club, but he won't arrive like that. He won't arrive. He knows he will have to make the effort. He will make the effort to adapt to, to the new dressing room, to a new country, new culture, everything. I just 
I just don't believe, knowing him well, and Frank and I know him really well, that he will arrive there and say, look at me, I'm the big ego here, I'm the big star, everybody will have to work for me and I'm not going to do anything. It won't be like that. He will work for everybody because he knows it's in his, in his interest. Like Frank said, he knows that for him to reach the Ballon d'Or heights, the Champions League heights and everything else, he needs to be part of this team and he will be. Who knows him better, you or Frank? Who's the best friend? <laughs> <laughs> both of us. Oh, yeah, both, yeah, yeah, most definitely. Um, boys, just uh, before we let you go, just uh, a quick reflection on Dortmund. I, I, I think it's just been tremendous what they achieved again in the Champions League. Obviously, the Bundesliga, a different season. It's easy. You know, I, I, I call this team kind of like the collection of like the, the, the unwanted, the, the waifs and strays. And I think it's worth reminding ourselves, and here we have to give credit to Terzic, who's not perfect, who's made mistakes, but you have Jaden Sancho and Ian Matson, unwanted by Manchester United and by Chelsea, coming over on loan. Nicholas Fulkrug, unwanted by everybody until, what, 18 months ago? Uh, Marcel Sabitzer, unwanted by Bayern. Mats Homos, unwanted by Bayern. Julian Rearson coming from Union Berlin. Imagine that. And, and yet, this group, they all come together and they say, you know what? We done screwed it up in the league. But here we are, Paris Saint-Germain, we're going to go out there and we're going to make them suffer. And they did, and they made Real Madrid suffer in the final, and it just wasn't enough. So I, I think in that way, I think Terzic has a lot to be proud of, and so do the players. I don't want to be too negative, right? <laughs> but a year ago, almost to this day, just a bit earlier, they lost the, the Bundesliga title, that, a, a title they should have never lost, right? It was theirs. They bottled it completely. And we said, I don't know how you come back from that if you're Terzic and some of those players. In the league, they've been really average. In the Champions League, okay, it's different. But tonight, they lose a final that really, until the hour, let's say, they were the better team by far. And again, I, I'm not sure how you come back from that. I'm, Mourinho was here tonight, and he went to see Terzic at the end, and he said, I mean, in Mourinho style, he said, oh, you can be proud of yourself, but you will never recover from tonight. And no. this is Mourinho being Mourinho, okay, but also <laughs> nice. being, being truthful. Thank you. Yeah, I know it was nice. But, I, but you do wonder, you, you <laughs> lost the Bundesliga title last year when it was yours, really. I mean, how do, it was harder to lose it than to win it. And then tonight, again, you were so close and yet so far, and it's not yours. I'm not sure if you're Terzic right now how you must feel. And I think it's Frank who said, I, don't want to, I would not want to be in that dressing room tonight. And I think he's right. And I would not want to be Edin Terzic tonight. Because even if there's a lot of positive you can take mm. from this Champions League campaign, and not only this Champions League campaign, nothing from the Bundesliga, is too huge failure back to back a year on from the Bundesliga title last season and yeah. the Champions League tonight. Uh, of course, we got everyone's predictions, didn't we, uh, ahead of the game. The majority went for Real Madrid. The likes of uh, Jürgen, of course, and Jan uh, went for Dortmund. Oh, Archie went for Dortmund. Oh, basically, anyone who's got any connection with Germany uh, went well, for... Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> no, but you're... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but congratulations, Ali. Thank you. Yeah, well Thank done. you. Craig got it right. Shaka, uh, Robbo, and oh, Gav Marcotti hey. got it right as well. Congratulations, hey. Gav. Um, the one good thing, though, the, with Dortmund uh, not winning Real Madrid, winning is we don't have to have Jan boasting that he got it right. Uh, just tell us your Jan story, please, Jules, because it's fantastic. Before we let you go. <laughs> yeah, because I saw him tonight. I hadn't told Gab yet. I saw him at the stadium tonight. Jan, he was, his studio uh, was just above where I was sat as an observer seat. And then he saw me, he said, Jules, Jules. And then he started talking to me in German. And I was like, well, that's weird. Anyway, I didn't say anything. And then I saw him at halftime again. And he went, he doubled up on the German. So I went along and went like, yeah, yeah, I don't know what he was saying, but he kept talking to me in German, so I don't know what happened. If, you know, he, he clearly recognized me because he called me by my name, <laughs> but there was a, yeah, something in his head. Maybe it was just too much German or something. It, I don't know. it was just in German mode. That was it. He can't, he can't switch it off. Uh, that, yeah, exactly. That's it. <laughs>